Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ivica Bogosadjic, so I'm a performance engineer. That means I a lot of my work involves in making uh, programs run faster and what is the best way to achieve this. And um, today I'm going to talk about C and I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about C and I'm going to talk about C++ from a bit different perspective than you normally have when you program. Because normally most people, when they do program, they don't care about performance, but from occasionally, from time to time, it happens that performance is important, even to that extent that the software cannot be shipped if the performance is not uh, good enough. And we're going to look, uh, we're going to look today a bit about uh, into the hardware, into the C++ compiler, C++ the way we are using the language C and C++, both of them. And uh, we'll see how, how performance, how that how the, the code that you write actually impacts the performance of your, the, of the performance of your program. And um, related to the, uh, the, the performance, there is a catchword, say, a catchword saying that the devil is in the details. So these are the things when you, if you're paying a close attention, you can get huge performance, huge performance um, uh, improvements. Uh, so any questions before we start? Is this going to be recorded? Uh, can we watch it online afterwards? Tina? Yeah, um, this uh, will be recorded and um, we will post the link also in the uh, in our meetup. Thank you very much. Okay, let's just start sharing my screen. So, so welcome. So now an official welcome. So I'm Ivica Bogosadovic, performance engineer. I write for a site called Johnny's Software Lab, which most articles deal deal with performance, how to measure performance, how to change performance. There are a lot of articles there. And uh, you can go and check it out. You can write me an email. You can ask me questions, anything related to performance and speed of your computers, speed of your programs. So the idea of today's talk is to talk about the price of dynamic memory in C and C++. So, how much does using dynamic memory actually costs in terms of performance? When I say dynamic memory, I mean the, the, the memory that uh, we explicitly allocate from the heap using, there are several ways to do it. If you're in C, you, you will use malloc and free functions. If you're working for in C++, normally you don't use those. You use new and delete. If you're using newer C++, then you have unique pointers, shared pointers, Maybe there's also other ways that uh, that you're using dynamic memory. For example, if you're using STL data structures such as vectors, such as maps, sets, whatever that holds your data internally does some kind of memory allocation. And when it does that, this influences performance. So let us let us start first. Um, I'm so, sorry, Ita, if you want to share your uh, slides, you will have to share your screen. Oh, sorry, I thought I shared them. Sorry, I'm sorry. Let me just find the button. Okay. Okay, tell me when you see them. Yes. Are you okay. seeing? Yes, thank you. Thanks. So first thing first, the introductions. So when we're talking about the, the way your program uses memory, there is basically two, two types, two ways that your program, or not necessarily program, but a module or a class or a larger part of the program can use memory. So normally, the, every program needs memory because the memory is very yeah, stored. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Hello. Okay, so there are two, if we are looking at the modules or the programs, if in case of smaller program, programs, there are two types of programs, those that allocate memory in a few large blocks, and those programs that allocate memory in many blocks during the program's, program's lifetime. So normally the first type where you allocate a, a block, a few blocks of memory, normally keep data in some kind of arrays 
or vectors. And from the memory, per, uh, per, from the performance point of view, this view this is good. So hardware likes blocks, hardware likes hardware likes sequential access to the memory. So if you're accessing arrays that you're accessing them in zero, one, two, three, first zero, first second, third element of an, of the array, this is what hardware likes. But for some application, this is not enough. And in those cases. Uh, in those cases, the program can and does during the complete lifetime of the program allocate a lot of memory, a lot of memory chunks. And these chunks can be small, medium, large, depending on the application. So if, you're, if your program is using uh, STL library, uh, such as STL uh, map, STL set, which internally use, which internally use binary trees, if it uses hash maps, you will have a lot of allocation, even though you're not aware of them. And those things can really influence the performance of your code. Also, if you're processing, uh, uh, even if you don't use STL, but you're processing a lot of instances of a single class. So this applies, this, this, this sentence applies to C++. If, you're, if you have an array and you're processing a lot of instances and for each instance of your class you're calling, you're allocating memory with you new, your program will allocate many blocks and this will have performance impact as you will see a bit later. Uh, so as I said, memory allocation, memory allocation and memory access in random access fashion so you're not accessing it sequentially, you're accessing it randomly. It's not easy to figure out, for the hardware to figure out, figure out, figure out the pattern you're accessing. Uh, you, those programs can suffer from performance degradation. So any questions? Okay, I'm moving on to the next slide. So uh, you, may ask, uh, you, you may ask yourselves, why, why is my program slow? My program that uses dynamic memory that allocates in this way it is slow. Why is it slow? So there are two reasons why it can be uh, why it can be slow. The first reason why it is slow is the performance of the malloc and the free that can be a bottleneck. So malloc and free are two uh, two uh, two functions, new and delete on in C but new and delete are just wrappers for malloc and free. And those functions, uh, those functions take time. And if you're calling a lot of them, they, they might take a lot of time. It might hap happen that 10 or 15% of your program's execution time is done calling malloc and free. Uh, if you look, so I don't know if everybody's familiar what, with what a profiler is, but profiler is a tool that can te tell you where your program is spending time. And if you look at the profiler output of your program, you will see that your program spends a lot of time in malloc and free functions. And when you see this, then that means that it's a good idea to investigate how you're allocating memory. So I'll, I'll show an example a bit later uh, on, how to, on, on how to do the profiling on one small example program and what we'll figure out from that. But malloc and free are not the only things that can cause that uh, that working by dynamic memory is slow. If you're accessing your data structure in a random access fashion, so again, tree cache map allocated objects and so on, performance will suffer due to data cache misses. So I don't expect that you know what data cache is, and I'll explain it a bit later. But just for the record, so there is something called data cache, cache misses, and if you're not accessing your memory correctly, it will slow down your program. So when you when you profile your program, when you are trying to investigate why is your program slow, uh, you will not see it will it will not be obvious for uh, as an uneducated guess. You see that the function is slow, but you cannot understand by just looking at the profiler output. You cannot understand why it is slow, and uh, in that case, there are specific special tools that can perform the that can perform uh, data cache analysis one of them is called perf the other one is cache grind and we'll talk about them a bit later okay this ends the second slide any questions okay so 
the first part of this talk will be about how to speed up malloc and free, how to speed up memory allocation and deallocation. The second part of the talk will be about how to speed up your memory access, how to speed, speed up your memory accesses. So we go with the first one. So we talk about allocators and what are allocators? Allocators are, let's say, library parts of the library of, of, of allocator is a library or a part of some other library that implements malloc and free, and that allows your program to allocate and deallocate memory on demand. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how allocators work internally because this is important to understand the consequences that this will have on your on, on the performance. What does allocator do internally is it goes to the operating system and asks for a large block of memory. When I say large block, maybe one megabyte or a few megabytes, maybe a few kilobytes, but not, not 64 bytes. So it will ask a large, it will ask for a large block of memory from the operating system. And from this block, it will serve your data with memory chunks it needs. When you call malloc, the allocator takes a block from the, a small chunk from this large block and give it back to you. It marks the block as, be, as taken. Um, when when you call free, the program uh, uses the return chunk. Uh, so when you call free, it returns that chunk that you were using back to the free list, so it can be reused. For allocation algorithms, must be very fast, but finding the chunk of available memory is not something that's easy, that's done easily. Here you can see how it looks like in a, in a case of really simple allocators. I, I don't think most serious allocation is done this way, but as you can see, th these parts of memory that are marked in green, uh, these are taken blocks, and these that are marked in white, that are they are available. And there is a list. Uh, all the free blocks are, are, are chained together in, the, in one linked list and the allocator then needs to go through this linked list and find the, the block of appropriate size. Okay, uh, let's move on. So in the next few slides, we'll talk about allocators and what challenges they, they face. This will help us understand why they are slow and strategies you can use to mitigate the speed of the allocators. You can also decide that you don't want to, there are several implement, open source implementation of allocators and probably there are some closed source allocators and you can, you can pick an, uh, you can opt for an off the shell allocator and just use it in your program. And this can have a significant speed performance, give, can give significant performance boost to your program. Occasionally, you might want to implement your own simple allocator for a specific allo application, and this will help you understand the prom problems you, you will face. Okay, any questions until now? Okay, moving on. The next, the next um, thing I want to talk about is memory fragmentation. So what, what is memory fragmentation? Your program is running for a long time. It allocates, it deallocates de memory, but as the time passes, it gets more and more difficult to find an empty slot of the right size. For example, you want, you asked with malloc, you ask for a block of 24 bytes size. At the beginning, when your program just started, it is easy to get this, this, this block. But as the time passes, it gets more and more difficult. And why it gets di uh, difficult? Because of memory, um, memory uh, fragmentation. So. Uh, look at this image here and this is like a big chunk of memory and this thing that is marked in green that's the taken taken uh, those those memory that that memory is taken and the, these pieces that are in white are actually memory that's available for the system to use so if you want to allocate for example five blocks if you go if the system just started it's really easy because all the memory is available but if, if it's been running for some while and the memory looks like this, with some of parts of the memory being taken yeah, and the other parts being free, your allocator will need time to find an, the place. For example, this is a, here, this is a block of size four and it might go to this linked list and to look for the, 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 the block of a 
appropriate size. Is that the, the appropriate size means that the block is neither the, 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 it must be big enough, but it shouldn't be too big. If it's too big, then you're just wasting memory. The memory fragmentation is visible is a serious problem for the long running programs and systems. So we had a we had a when I was working earlier we had a set of boxes set the box is this TV box you know you had in home at your home probably it's like a small box you attach to a TV and it allows you to watch television. Now these things run for can run for for several days and you might notice that you might notice that. Um, you might no, notice that when it's running, uh, when it's running, um, as the time passes, it gets slower and slower. We had that the same issue. We had a test that changes channel every every ten seconds, and at the beginning, it took like two seconds to change the channel, and after twenty four hours, it took 10, 10 seconds to 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 change the channel. And why? Because the memory fragmentation. The, the malloc and free were getting slower and slower and slower. So you have that the same issue in Windows. You used to have it. For example, if the Windows was running for a several days, it would get slower and slower. And then when you restart it, it would become fast again. Again, this is the problem of memory fragmentation. It might have memory fragmentation can cause that your system doesn't have enough memory, even though it has. But you cannot get it as one continuous big block. So if you're allocating a block of memory, for example, to display an image, it might happen that this block is not available. So all allocators have to deal with uh, all allocators have to deal with uh, this problem, and they need to solve it one way or the other. If your program is a long-running one, you want to pick a, an allocator that uh, doesn't suffer a lot from memory fragmentation problems. So there are several ways to tackle this problem. One, one simple is to occasionally restart your program, and this is done. In our case of set the box, we used to every time three more three o'clock in the morning we used to restart the set the box without users' consent, and then this fixes problem of the memory fragmentation and slowdown. And this off, that this this is often done. Uh, the other thing that you can do to avoid memory fragmentation is to pre-allocate all the needed memory at the program beginning. There are some programs that do that, and they completely dispense with malloc and free, and they just use pre-allocated memory. Another way to do it is to cache memory chunks. So you get your memory chunks with malloc, but you don't return them with free. You keep them around in case you ne might need them later. And the fourth way to do it is use special memory allocators that promise low fragmentation. So there are memory of the shelf memory allocator with low fragmentation that you can use. And they don't suffer. Each allocator suffer from this, but not all allocators suffer, suffer in the same extent. Of course, not every technique that I mentioned just is not is applicable everywhere. So this closes the topic of memory fragmentation. Any questions? Uh, I have two comments. Yes. Uh, first of all, there is a fifth option, uh, also not always applicable, uh, which is occasionally defragmenting your uh, memory cache. That obviously requires double referencing because you will be moving objects in memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second thing, it's worth mentioning the two types of memory fragmentation, internal and external. Uh, uh, internal and external, I'm not familiar with those. Uh, with those uh... Uh, they basically, they are a, a trait of one of the other. If you allocate uh, bigger chunks of memory, you will get uh, more uh, wasted space in side blocks. Okay. And okay. on the other hand, th those holes that uh, you showed up in your uh, graphic earlier, uh, that's the external fragmentation, which is outside the blocks. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. So there is a there is a way to there is a defragmentation in C plus plus. I don't know if it's possible to. So the way it's done, it's uh, you need to re, 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 you need to uh, if you want to defragment memory, we probably need to pause the execution of the program and then do this housekeeping work. I don't know if that's possible. Probably it is, but it's probably com complicated to set up, right? Mm. No, uh, the memory that C++ sees, uh, which is virtual memory, I think you, uh, maybe with some custom allocators, you could do something like that. 
but obviously uh, you have uh, objects that set addresses, so that's not possible. But one other thing to bear in mind is that you also have the physical memory, to, virtual memory uh, maps too. So the operating system may be able to do to occasionally do something about that. Mm, don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. What I think it's possible in case of memory fragmentation, it's possible that you. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to stay after this. Uh, after this uh, well, just just one quick can... comment. What you can do is occasionally when you release blocks, you can smartly unite them and then you have some opportunities to do something because you, you can move around free space, but not allocated space. Exactly. You cannot move around the allocated space in C++, at least not easily. And Java and other languages managers can do that, but C++ cannot do that. Okay, but I, I, I suggest that uh, we don't have a lot of time and I have a lot of slides. Uh, we can stay around after the talk and talk if you like. Okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. So this this is done, this closes the topic of memory allocation, uh, fragmentation. You, you will need to fear memory fragmentation if you don't have a lot of memory and you're working in a long running system and these typically are embedded systems. Okay. So that's one thing related to the problems that all allocators face. The second thing is thread synchronization. So if you have a system you program with several threads and this is common nowadays, and if your allocator internally uses one block of memory to allocate memory for several threads, you will need to protect the critical section. Since the malloc and free functions need to be fast, you need to have a mutexes there. And this can really slow down the allocator. Okay, questions? I hear some background noise. Okay. There is some background noise. Somebody hasn't muted his uh, microphone. Okay, many allocators solve this problem by using pet thread memory blocks. So if you have several thread, each thread gets its own block. And in that case, you don't need any any uh, any synchronization, but this in this increases memory consumption. Now, what happens if the program allocates memory block in one thread and releases it releases it in another thread? So, if you if you decide to do it like this and you don't have any 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 synchronization, you will probably need to build some kind of mechanism for the transfer of ownership from one thread to another, and this is something that's complicated. The STL, the standard, standard C++ library, and probably standard C library try to keep things simple. So they don't like uh, complicated code. And this is the complicated stuff. And you won't see that in, in this kind of manage, management a lot in, in the code. OK, moving on. So memory allocation pattern. So when you allocate the memory, there is a certain pa pattern that you will follow, that, you, that, that your program can follow. So if your program is slow because it allocates and allocates a lot of chunks, you need to understand these memory allocation patterns. Uh, because the memory allocation pattern can influence the behavior of the allocator. Allocate, if you know your memory, if you know at least you have some, some, uh, some knowledge about the allocation pattern, you, you, you will know what kind of optimizations you can use and what to expect from, expect from the allocator. So one of the patterns you need to take care of is when does your program allocate memory? So there are programs that pre-allocate everything. In this case, you don't have to worry about the allocator and the allocator. There are the, the, those programs that allocate, that do allocation in bursts. The, the, those programs or those modules that do, do, do allocation in bursts. The program is, run, is silent for some time and then it's running. And then it's silent for some time and then it's running. You see that there is a peak Generally, the, the memory uh, memory uh, consumption is low, but there are certain peaks. Um, there are certain peaks. There is also a pattern of gradual allocation. So gradual allocation is that the allocation slowly but steadily grows. So this doesn't happen. Eventually, it needs to stop. But and how do you solve the pro the the, 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 pro the problem of memory allocation in this case? If you pre-allocate everything, you don't have any problems. If you do allocation in, bur in burst, then you can introduce caching. And what caching means is that you don't return the memory back to the allocator, you keep it around for some time, because then you can reuse it fast. 
in case you have a gradual allocation, then you need to find a good allocator. Okay. Questions? Questions? Okay. Uh, this uh, this pattern of allocation in bursts often happens if you're using STL containers. So STL containers will allocate memory. STL containers will allocate memory, and when the container in, is destroyed, it will release all the memory back to the system. In C++ in L11 and probably maybe also the earlier version, the STL containers, vectors, maps, unordered maps, and so on, allow programmers to provide a custom allocator as a template parameter. So I guess everybody is familiar with C++ here, so you all know, know what template is. So you can customize your vectors, maps, and unordered maps, and all the STL containers with templates, and you can provide the allocator as part of the template. This is a very good choice if performance is important and your data structure, typically this is map or set, performs a lot of small allocations. So maps and sets, STD map and STD set internally use use trees and these allocate a lot of memory a lot of small chunks uh, if you provide the stl container with a custom allocator you can control the allocation the good thing about this approach is that since your uh, your your how should i say your container it allocates memory only from its own block and when it releases when it's destroyed it releases all the block all the memory back in that case, there will be no memory fragmentation and you can return the empty block back to the operating system. Um, the STL allocators, so this is a class, some kind of class, they implement some, some methods called allocate and the allocate and the data structure uses this to get and release memory. So here is an example of a custom allocator for STL containers. So let's just go through simply just run through the code for a short time. So this is, I called it zone allocator. And in the constructor of this zone allocator, I ask using mmap system call from Linux, I ask 1000 megabytes, one gigabyte of memory. And I use mmap to return that memory back. So there are two, there are a lot of functions here, but two that are important are allocate in the allocate. In allocate, so, I know this my zone allocator will be used by SDL and this this size will always be constant. So the size of the type will always be constant. And I can I don't need to take care. I'll just take from this gigabyte of memory, I'll just take first available chunk and give it back. I think this is the fastest possible way to allocate memory. And when the data structure calls the allocate the allocate, we don't do anything. And why we don't do anything? Well, since this is a zone, this is an allocator that is will be specific for one, one STL container. When this thing gets destroyed, I know that the allocate must have been called for all the chunks. So there is no need to do, do this. So zone allocation, this is called zone allocator and zone allocations are used everywhere. If you have, for example, let me give you an example of, of, of uh, Chrome. When you open a new tab in Chrome, uh, it will uh, assign a chunk of memory for that tab and it will allocate from that tab. But when you close the tab, it can release all the memory simultaneously. It doesn't need to, to, to call for each, each element on the page, uh, text, text box, image, and so on. It doesn't need to call the allocate. It can release the memory all in one shot. And this, this is important for the speed. And this is the reason this zone allocation model works in those kind of scenarios when there is some kind of session being created which lasts for some time and then when the, 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 the session is destroyed you can release the complete memory back to the operating system and you don't you, you don't need to call it the allocate or free for indiv individual chunks questions there is one question in the chat why do you use mmap and not malloc so malloc is when you're asking for the so there is an allocator that is part of the standard C++ library. It's called it, it has interface malloc and free. But if internally that allocator needs to ask for memory from the operating system, so it needs to go to the operating system and asks for memory. 
And this is done using mmap and, and mnmap on Linux. So this is an implementation of an allocator. OK, more questions. Uh, yes, I would have a question. Um, uh, I read in the standard that there are requirements on copy construction of STL uh, allocators. Uh, will you explain that? Sorry, I don't know about that. I didn't read the standard related to this. This is my code I used in some in some of my private projects. Okay, thank you. So just one notice here. You might notice that the mmap call allocates ask from the operating system for one gigabyte of memory. That's a lot of memory. But what happens is that it doesn't get it. It gets the block, but it doesn't it's the operating system doesn't allocate memory for that block. Only the first time the allocator writes something to the memory, that block will actually be allocated by the operating system. Okay? So this is the talk about virtual memory and physical memory. The operating system will allocate one gigabit of virtual memory, but behind it, there is not one gigabit of physical memory. Only when the, the allocator, when the program starts writing to that memory, the operating system takes over, takes the control and allocates actual block of physical memory to map to the block of virtual memory, okay? Yeah, thank you. Questions, more questions? Okay, moving to the next slide. So this was related to the zone allocator. Why do we need zone allocation? So one question you want to ask yourself is how does the allocation and the allocation pattern look like? Again, this is, is it growing or is it this zigzagging like this? Because that will, uh, that will tell you what kind of strategy that you can use. I already explained memory chunk caching and when, uh, when you're going to use it. But here is, for example, an example from real world scenario. Imagine you have two threads and they're communicating by sending blocks by sending some data between them. So the thread one is allocating a memory and it's giving the memory back to the thread two. The thread two reads some data from that memory and then calls free or delete, deletes this object. And you see still a constant that, that the first thread is allocating a few blocks of memory and the second thread is consuming that memory. It actually, you, you will need normally need like 10 blocks of memory to serve the complete, all the requests, all the allocation and the allocations made in one thread and the other thread. This is a good way to introduce caching if, if the performance is important. When, you, when the second thread receive, receives, receives the block, it doesn't go, give it back to the operating system. It just passes it back to the first thread so you can reuse it again. Okay, is this clear? Okay. I, if there, I don't see the chat. So if 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 there are questions on the chat, can somebody please read them for me? Yes, we will do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, here is an example how memory chunk, chunk caching is done in a program. So what I'm doing here, I am overloading operator new and operator delete, and I have like maximum chunk chunk count which is thirty, and if I have a list, a linked list of available chunks, and if this list has chunks, I'll just take the first chunk from the list. If it doesn't, I'll call malloc and get my, my chunk. Again, the implementation delete. If, we, if, if the list has less ch chunks than the max ch chunk count, in that case, we just add the, the chunk to the beginning of the chunk list. If, there are too many chunks already available, we call free in that case. Okay, moving on. Next slide. There are several other things that you should uh, keep in. We have a question in the chat. Yes. Um, the question is, if you have different sizes for different objects, so how do you guarantee not wasting too much memory? Uh, you need to provide more context for that. So um, what do you mean? Uh, different objects of different different uh, sizes. Um, Mo, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. 
or clarify? Hello? Um, seems like we're not getting more information. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the ma management of uh, different blocks of different sizes a bit later. I don't have enough enough information to answer that question, but you can write it and you can ask it a bit later. Okay. 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 Excuse me. Yes. Yes. Sir? yes. Uh, I, I do want to ask a little bit about uh, uh, if you know uh, regarding usage of other uh, malloc implementations. Like uh, I know that uh, uh, Emery Berger, the one who uh, had a keynote in CBTCon, has his own uh, malloc implementations, and whether uh, using those uh, is, uh, I guess, recommended, or what, does it uh, help in any way uh, regarding uh, on top of overloading? Uh, overloading? Yeah, uh, yes, that's the idea of this lecture. I'm just giving you introduction until I get to that point. So the idea okay. is to show how you can use different allocators and what you can expect with that, okay? Okay, thank you. So there are some other things that you should keep in mind uh, about the memory allocation patterns. Does your program allocate memory in many small chunks or few, fewer, fewer larger chunks? Is memory allocated and deallocated in the same order? So this is important. If you're allocating in one order and you're deallocating in the opposite order, this makes job for the allocator really for the allocator really easy. If there is a way in program to achieve this, that might be beneficial for the for the for the allocator. And this avoids also the memory fragmentation. Does your program allocates memory in one thread and then deallocates it in another thread? We talked about that. This typically lowers performance, and if you can avoid that, you should definitely try to do that if it's possible. Is your program a long running one? So if you have a program that is a long running program, you might want to, to restart the program occasionally. You want to consider implementing the ability to save your program state to a file and then restart the program and then load its state from the file. This is also done for some application. You can also use allocation pool where you have several pools of memory depending on the chunk size. Uh, this works very well with system with, on systems with large virtual memory space, and these are typically 64-bit architectures. So desktop systems, some embedded systems have 64-bit address spaces, and they can they, they can benefit from that. This so this is how per chunk size allocation pools look like. So there is one list for eight byte chunks. There is another list for 16 byte chunks, and another list for 24 byte chunks. And the allocators actually do use this. Because in this case, you look at the size of your of, of, of the, the requested chunks, you go to the, to the list, and then you just pick the first one from the list. This avoids the memory fragment. Hello? Hello? Okay, this avoids okay. memory this fragmentation avoids memory problems, but, uh, but um, this avoids memory fragmentation problems, but increases memory consumption. Okay. That's the talk related to the allocators and how they how they work internally and what 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 kind of challenges they face. Now, what you do have are off-the-shelf allocators. So there are allocators that come as uh, libraries, and there are several very good uh, open-source allocators that you can use in your own projects. If if malloc and free is not working fast, if not fast enough for you, or your program is suffering from memory fragmentation or your program uses too much memory and maybe you want to want to want to decrease it so you can decrease the memory consumption by changing the allocator because each allocator um, introduces has some overhead which will consume more memory no allocator is, is perfect for all applications you need to test them and verify them with your own program set because there is no, there is actually no way to test an allocator because there is not a benchmark that is uh, that is suitable for all possible cases. Things that you should keep in mind related to the allocators is the allocation speed. You want them to be fast. Memory consumptions. You want them to consume, not to consume a lot of memory. You want you want to keep in mind the memory fragmentation, especially if your program is a long running one. And there is a fourth thing that's cache locality. But we'll talk a bit a bit about later on. Just 
to let you know if your allocator returns the cache, uh, uh, um, returns a chunk of memory that is in the data cache, it will be fast. If it doesn't, it will be slow. But later on about that. OK. Standard C library provides implementation of malloc and free. These are the most commonly available on Linux. But other allocators on Linux, and also another operating system, is R. TC malloc by Google, J G A malloc by Facebook, Me malloc by Microsoft. There is something called Horde allocator, PT malloc, Dell malloc, and there are other also implementation of allocators. You can install those allocators from the repository. Each of them makes certain trade-offs in terms of speed, in terms of memory consumption. So there is no good or bad. You should try them, measure speed, measure consumption, and see one which and look, try to figure out which one suits best, best suits your needs. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a short demonstration of the allocators. So I already told you that the allocator comes, allocators come as libraries that you can either link, you, you can link your programs against those libraries or on Linux, you can replace them and write and run time without any linking. There's LD preload and LD preload environment, var environment variable that you can use to override the default allocator. And here's an example. So you, you specify LD preload, and then you put the path to the, to, the, um, to the library containing malloc and free implementation, and then you call your program. Let's test now the performance of few allocators. Let's, I'm going to show you an example in terminal. Any questions up to this point? OK, let's move on to example. This will be more fun. OK, I have this. Let me show you. I have this call file call. Do you see all? Do you see on my screen? And is the font big enough? Okay. I think the font is a bit too small. Okay. Um, I zoomed it in. Is this better? Yes, it could be a bit bigger. A bit, bit bigger. Uh, font, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me show you the example I created. So this is completely made up program. And uh, I'm, I'm just showing you to you how you can first figure out if the memory memory problem. And second thing you want to do is to replace the allocators. I already installed the allocators. They're available in, in the repositories. I already installed them so we don't waste time with that. So I have three classes. In my case, these are structs, but these are classes. One is called subject, one is called student, and the third one is called professor. And uh, there are subjects, each subject, subject has a name. Student has a student ID and a name and list of subjects he's visiting. And the professor has a name, has a list of subjects he's teaching. Okay. So I have this function that generates random strings. Okay. That I will use to populate subject, student, and professor. So here is my main. I have a vector of subjects. I have a set of students, which internally uses tree, remember, which allocates a lot of memory. Then I have a set of professors. Then I have a vector of students, a vector of professors. So first I generate one 10,000 subjects. And then I, I allocate, create, and delete some professors, create professors, I put them in array. Then I put them in the professor set. Then I put students in array, put students in professor set. A student set, then remove them. So I want to see how the system behaves when I create the lead. So this creates a lot of, a lot of work for the memory memory allocator and the allocator. So all this talk about replacing the allocator works when the bottleneck is the allocator, the malloc free, and you will need to see that in in the uh, in the in the uh, in the profiler output. Now I'm going to start the profiler perf record call graph we call it dwarf and then i'm going to call allocation test but this thing takes a few seconds to complete and then go perf report perf so the perf record command uh, perf record command uh, 
tracks the execution of the program and save this into a file called perf.data. And when you call perf report, you, you can see the, the, the profile. And if you can look, look at here, you see that 77% was spent in gen random function. That means that our program spent 77% doing generating random strings. But for example, you can see here that it spent 4% of its time in the operator new uh, and also spend some time, it spent some time in turn, this int free means internal free. It spent 3% of, of time there and it spent also some time in malloc. So we have like maybe six to 7% of time that the allocation, the allocation is, is, is this program spends around six to 7% of time doing allocation and the allocation memory. So this is a nice thing to optimize. Let's try now. We'll try several, several, um, uh, several uh, allocators. So here is here is the commands. So I installed the TC malloc, GA malloc, and me malloc. And of course, there is the standard malloc that is part of the standard C++ library. You see here that I use LD preload to to replace to replace the the, the, the built-in allocator which is part of the standard C++ library. So let's run it. Make run allocate and test. So it will take a few, a minute or so. So I'm using this utility called multi-time that can, this utility multi-time is really nice because it can repeat the command, in my case, five times. So I want to see, I want to see some average. I don't want to see maybe due to some external influences, this time can be shorter or or, or longer. Also, this multi-time utility has this R usage, which will display not only the time that my program took, how much time it to take to execute, but it also display the information about the used memory, resource usage. R usage stands for resource usage. And you can see here that when we are doing the standard standard library allocator, it, it takes 3.5 seconds on average. But if I, re I replace it with libtc malloc, it takes 3.1 seconds on average. So I save there a lot, three or 400 microseconds, which is not a bad thing if the performance is what you're chasing. Now the test is running for j malloc, and this one is a bit worse. So the tc malloc is 3.1, the, the GA, ga malloc is 3.3, and the me malloc is Microsoft malloc. I think it's the best one. So it's, well, not in this test, it's 3.2. 3.3 is the J malloc, 3.1 is the TC malloc, and 3.5 is the lib standard C++ malloc. So as you can see, all three allocators are faster than the, the, than the regular, than the, than the built-in standard C++, the, the malloc and three that are part of the standard C++ libraries. I'm gonna show you, there are these, these two lines that are also interesting here. This one is called maximum resident set, and it means the maximum amount of memory that your program used during this your during its execution. It's in kilobytes. So my program took 168, 168 megabytes of memory. And in case of TC malloc, it took less 150. In case of JE malloc, it took 170 megabytes. And uh, in case of me malloc, it took 160. As you can see that uh, TC malloc, it has really good performance and uh, low memory usage. Okay. I hope this is clear. Any questions? Can you just use any of those allocators uh, or do they come with caveats such as uh, maybe they create problems uh, in your threads? So normally all these allocators, at least all these four of them should be, should be, um, should be uh, thread safe. So you can use it in your code that has more than one threads. But for example, I know for TC malloc, which is really fast, I know for it that it doesn't return memory back to the operating system. So there is a caveat, but you need to read the documentation for that. 
So if you have a, if you have a really long running program that's running for several days, maybe you don't want to use TC malloc. Maybe you want to use some other allocator. Also, the performance will be probably be a bit better if you are linking, if you're statically li linking your malloc and free. So I'm using this LD preload mechanism that's not the fastest one in the world. Okay, more questions. Okay, I, I I don't have any feedback here, so I'm I it, it, for me I have an impression like I'm talking to my dog, so I hope this talk is interesting, and I hope you're having a, a good time. Okay, somebody wants to say something. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's make a break here. Let's do until uh, now. It's uh, seven. 24 until 7.30. Let's continue 7.30. We have a lot of material in the second part. The second part deals with the memory. Uh, the second part deals with the memory um, usage. Uh, okay. 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 Five minutes break. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want, I'm going to stay here. You can ask questions, but, uh, but uh, we won't talk. Yeah, if, if you want to, you can um, check out the chat. Um, Mo expanded a little bit on his question, um, but it's too much for me to read out loud. So it would be better for you to read the question, maybe you try to answer it. Okay. Uh, oh man, how do I make this go away? Uh. <laughs> okay, how do I stop? Is my screen still shared? I think it is. Okay. No, it's not shared. Okay, let me open this. So, yeah, sorry, my mic doesn't seem to be working. So let's say I'm building a simple game and I have a big memory block that I'm, be, I'm using to construct smaller objects from and maybe putting into a sorted double or sorted links and some other data section. When these objects, let's say they are enemies, get shot by the player, they die. And let's say these enemies are not of any single type, but a few different types and each have a different size. Although in all likelihood, they will all inherit from some enemy ba base class or something like that. Is there any way to guarantee that the memory block will be perfect size fit for those enemy block? Uh, the allocator don't do that. So you will get the block. So if you ask for 30 block of 32 bytes, you will get 32 bytes. But the allocator might have given you block of 32 bytes, 48 bytes, 64 bytes. It knows the best. So if you want to do the implement uh, allocator yourself, um, uh, you you want to let me share my screen again. You will probably want to uh, you will probably want to do something like this. I hope you're seeing my screen. You want to probably do something like this, or maybe you want to maybe you 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 can carve also a memory from a single block like this. But in that case, it will be slower. So uh, my suggestion is that you use off-the-shelf allocators since they're faster. I know for sure that many many software that needs to be fast, for example, Chrome uses, uses its own memory allocator. Uh, um, uh, Firefox also uses its own memory allocator. They want to keep this, make the speed as fast as possible. I hope this talk about memory allocation and the allocation was fun. I see that there are, a lot, there are a few people who are uh who are um who are doing like this kind of integration system engineering when this this kind of work related to memory allocation is important so paul asked what's next in the talk please so we we covered the allocate allocators we are moving on to uh, uh we're moving on to memory access patterns so do you, do you see my screen now not yet okay No. Okay. You see it now? Yes. Cool. So the first part of the talk was about the allocators. It was about how how the performance of your program depends on the malloc and free. If you make malloc and free fast, your perform your program will perform faster. But that's only one part of the talk. So the second part is related to performance of the memory access. So if your program allocates and deallocates a lot of memory, 
the performance of the allocate variable will be important for the overall speed. But if your program performance depends, but but your program's performance also depends on the way you access your memory, and more specifically, how is your data laid out in memory, and what is the access pattern to your data? So we were talking about the uh, allocation access pattern. Now we uh, alloc all allocation pattern. Now we talk about the access pattern to your data. If you think of malloc and free as two function calls that you call to get and release memory, and you don't take the, uh, the underlying hardware into account, you won't achieve good performance, the best performance. You might achieve some well performance, but not the best performance. Highest performance can be achieved only if the allocated abstraction is broken. So you're removing malloc and free. You don't say, I don't know what they do. In, ca in case you're removing the abstraction, you say, I know what malloc and free are doing, and I, I rely on them to do it in a certain way if I want to have the best performance. The, your algorithm that allocates memory needs to be aware of how the allocator works in, in order to allocate memory optimally. In order for the later memory access to be good enough. Okay, so Let's talk a bit about cache memories because cache memory is actually what's slowing down programs for the last 20 years and it will continue to slow down programs until they, until, until hardware engineers think a memory that is cheap and as fast as computers. And I don't know if this will ever happen. So memory speed is a bottleneck on modern systems. So CPU, the processor, typically spends around 200 to 300 cycles waiting for the value it needs to be fetched from the memory. If CPU needs an instruction in the CPU needs data from the memory, and that memory, uh, it will need to wait two to 300 in cycles. In that time, it can do to three, 200 to 300 simple instructions. So that's a lot of wasted time. And the CPU designers introduced a small on CPU memory called the cache memory. So the, I, I assume that most people are familiar to some extent with caches, but I'm gonna repeat this anywhere. So the cache memory is a small memory that is really fast and that's inside the CPU. It's not outside. And the CPU keeps the data it is currently using. The data that the CPU is currently using is called data set. So your program works with some data and then move on, moves on to work with some other data. There is always a, some data that is important at, at, at one specific time that is important for your program and this data is called data set. So if your CPU wants to access a data from memory, wants to access data from memory, it first checks it if that data is already available in the cache. If it's available, it can get its data really, really fast. But if it's not in the cache, then that data needs to be fetched from the main memory. All modern CPUs, all modern CPUs, embedded CPUs, uh, high performance CPUs, CPUs have cache memories. Maybe the cheapest embedded, system, embedded CPUs with 8 bit, 8 bit CPUs don't have cache memories, but a lot of them have it. If you look at the modern CPU, the size of the CPU, half of that half of that surface is dedicated to the to the cache, and the other half is actually the logic that does something. Uh, the cache memories are smart, so when the when CPU needs the memory, it will it will fetch the memory. Uh, when the CPU needs the data from the main memory, the cache memory will load that will load that data from the main memory to the cache memory. But after some time, if the cache figures out that memory is not needed anymore, it will return that data to the main memory to, to free, free up space in the cache. This process is called eviction, making space for the new data in the cache. The CPU has a component called data prefetcher. Prefetcher, prefetch means that to get something in advance. If the CPU can figure out memory access pattern, it can prefetch data from the main memory into the cache memory before the data itself is needed. So if your program is accessing memory in a certain pattern, the CPU can figure this out, this component called data prefetcher, 
and it can prefetch memory to the uh, data from the memory to the cache before it's even needed. Um, okay, is this clear? I hope this is clear. Any questions? So when you allocate memory using new or malloc, does it go to the CP, the, the cache memory or the main memory? So so when you call malloc and free, so every so malloc and free are just instructions, and everything in your program are just instructions. And these some of those instructions access memory. They read from memory or they write to memory. Every instruction that reads from memory or that writes to memory will first check if the memory location is available in the cache memory. If it is, it will get it really fast. But if it's not, it will need to wait for the data to be fetched from the memory to the cache. And this will take 200, 300 cycles, depending on the, on the CPU. OK, is this clear? Yeah, thank you. OK. So let me give you a, a short analogy with books. So um, for... I'm sorry, uh, I have a small thing. Can you change the slides to full screen? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, I forgot. Thank you. Okay. It's better this way. So there is an analogy with books, uh, uh, with cache memories. So how does that work in real life? You have the cache principle in your life. Imagine you have your desk and on your desk you have a place for eight books but you have a library somewhere behind. And when you're working on your desk, you're gonna keep eight books that you actually need. And the other books, you will keep, the, keep them in, in the library. If you need a new book, you will go fetch it from the library, but you need to take one of the books from your desk and uh, return it back to the library, okay? So th that's the eviction process. So. The cache memory is limited in size and some memory needs to be returned back to the main memory. Some books need to be returned back to the library. If your library is sorted, for example, by author, you and you need to write about authors in alphabetical order, you can prefetch the book you will need in advance. So if you know which books you're gonna need in advance, you you can prefetch, you can get them before you, before you even need them. But you need to figure out the, pre, the you need to figure out, you need to figure out what which books you're going to need them. On the hardware level, it's difficult to, to, to this is difficult to do. So one important thing about the cache memories and the way how they internally work are, is our cache lines. So each cache memory is divided into cache lines. And typically on modern systems, they are 64 bytes in size. So 64 bytes on the cache block of 64 bytes in the cache corresponds to a block of 64 bytes in the memory. So there is a correspondence there. If your program is accessing just one byte inside the block, the whole block will be fetched to the cache. So the whole block, which is 64 bytes in size, will be fetched to the cache. When it is fetched, any access to that block is basically free, very cheap, because that block is already in the cache. So the cache memory works on the block level. So it caches data on the block level, which is typically 64 bytes. There are some architectures which have smaller or bigger. If your program organizes your data so that the data is accessed together, that the data that you're accessing together is close to one another in memory, you will see performance improvements. So if there are two variables and they're one after another in memory, when you're accessing the first, you're basically getting access to the second three or very cheap. But if, the, if, if they're far, if, if there's space between, there is, there is memory blocks between, there are some other variables between, in that case, the second access will result in a cache miss. And then you'll have your performance. This will lower your performance. So here's an example. Here's this class called my vector. It has a template count, which creates a, an array of, in our case, 10 elements. And there is this, this value used, which holds how many elements of the class are, of, of the array are actually used. And we have this int sum, which, what, what does it do? It goes 
from zero to the used elements of the array and sums them up and returns the result. Now here the, on the left, there is one implementation and on the right, there is a second implementation. And the only difference is that the first, the used is first, the, the member used is first and the member values is second. And on the right side, hand side, the, the member values is first and the used is second, okay? The question is for this operation, which implementation is faster and why? Any, any, any answers? Okay, let's see. Look at, you, look at this function called sum. This result is on the set, stack. First we are accessing the variable used and then we are accessing values of zero, okay? In this case, the memory layout is so that used is the first four bytes of the class, the value zero is the second four bytes and so on. In this case, values of zero is the first four bytes, values of one is the second four bytes and so on. And used is after 64 bytes or more. So what you can see here, that we are using this member used and this member values of zero together. And this code will have less, will better use memory cache because used and values of zero lie on the same cache line. They're consecutive in memory, okay? And from the performance point of view, this, this implementation will be faster for this, for this code. Is this clear why? Uh, actually, not entirely. I think yes. I'm missing something here. On the yes. left side, you you start off with fewer cache misses because you have used, and then you're accessing the lower indexes of uh, values. Okay. On the right example, you have the opposite. You start off far away, but then you get closer because you are accessing higher indexes of values. But no, I'm accessing them from zero to used. If used is five, I'm accessing values zero, values one, values two, values three, values four. Mm, so you don't get all the way to, to 10? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Okay, so uh, you can expect one cache miss. So if, if this class is not in the cache, you can expect one cache miss for accessing the used, and then you can expect one cache miss for ac accessing values of zero in the second example. In the first example, you'll see only, only cache, one cache miss. And from that point on, it will work fine. Okay. So this brings us to prefetching. So as I already said, if the hardware can figure out the memory access pattern, it will prefetch pre -fetch data from main memory before the CPU even needs it. So if we are accessing memory sequentially one by one, the prefetcher will figure this out. So look at this example. We have, we are accessing this array and we are accessing one by one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And the hardware prefetcher figures this thing out and it can prefetch data before the, the CPU even needs them, okay? Now, what kind of patterns what kind of memory access pattern can the hardware prefetcher figure out? Well, it can figure out all the all the patterns where the stride is constant. Stride is difference between two the two, ele two elements. So if the stride is one, it works best. So if you are accessing element zero, element one, element two, element three, if you're accessing like zero, element four, element eight, element 12 and so on, it will work also, but it's, it's lower in performance. You can also, prefer, you can go through the array forward, backward, doesn't matter, it works the same. So I'm gonna give you example in the command line, just for you to see this. Okay. Okay, I have this class, I have this file called access pattern test. So what I'm doing here, I have a main function. I allocate 100 megabytes, 100 mega elements of 100 mega in integers, so 100 million integers. I create a random array and then I create this array called map. 
So I generate, fill this array map with sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I want to access the input array according to the elements of this map array, okay? So if I generate sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, I will, I will be accessing inputs, elements, first element 0, then element 1, element 2, and 3, and so on. But I want to test also that I'm accessing the array backwards. So n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and so on. So I'm accessing elements of the array backwards. The next thing I want to also access elements of the array, but I want to do it in uh, with a stride that is bigger than one. So I'm accessing element zero, then element 16, then element 24. And the last experiment I want to do, I want to shuffle the map array. So this means that I'm accessing the, the input, input array completely randomly element 325, element 27, element 178, and so on. So let's see how it behaves, okay? So let's start with the 0, 1, 2, okay? So I'm gonna do make clean, make, let's, uh, let's do multi-time, let's say five times, access pattern test. So it takes 89 milliseconds to run, then 102 milliseconds to run, then 89 milliseconds to run, then 102 milliseconds to run, and lastly, uh, 102. So just a second. So you can, if you can see here, I'm just summing all the elements of the of the of the array, but I'm doing it according to the this I'm. I take the index from the map array, and then I sum it in that, uh, do the summation in that order. So this is when the sequence is 0, 1, 2. But let's do it differently. Let's go backwards. So do you, does anybody have an expectation? Will this be faster, slower, so on? I would guess a little bit slower. Okay, let's see. Why do you think so? Uh, it's still a regular pattern, so it's still fast, but maybe forward is a little bit better than backward for the prefetcher. Well, I don't think there is any difference if you're doing forward or backward prefetching, at least not according to this measurement, so it doesn't matter. But let's see a more... more uh, Let's see a different example. Now we're gonna we're gonna with this with this with did this with backwards. Now let's do it sequence 0, 16, 24, and so on. Let's see what will happen there. Can anybody guess? It will be slower, but how much slower? Probably a lot slower because it's still loading complete cache lines. Okay, let's see. 317 milliseconds. 370. So it's about three and a half times slower. And why do you think it's slower? For each element it loads, it loads a complete cache line. Yes. Yes. So, so take advantage of those holes in the access, access pattern. Yes. Yes. So when you're accessing element zero, element one, element two, element three, when you're accessing this element zero, element one and element two be, belong to the same cache line and it will, they will be loaded automatically. The CPU has a limited bandwidth to the memory. And when you're accessing zero, 16, 24 and so on, this will have a, a real, uh, the memory, although the hardware prefetcher can prefetch memory, there is a limit on how much memory it can get, how much data it can get from the main memory. And this is what's slowing, this is what's slowing down our program. Now let's try this, the, the, let's try to randomize the map array and see what happens. 
It will also be slower, just to what extent? Okay, we do shuffle here. Oh, 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 oh. I did something badly. Wait. Uh, 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 wait. Uh, you have nothing in your array. Oh, sorry? Uh, in your source code, you need the first line writing the consecutive numbers into the array before shuffling it. Now yeah. you have just access right. to zero source, right. I think. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yes, I need this. I need this thing. You're right. You're right. Okay. So we had 370 milliseconds, and here we have 856. We went from 80 milliseconds to 80 milliseconds to 850 milliseconds. So it's almost 10 times slower. If you're accessing things randomly, it's 10 times slower. So this is something to bear in mind. If you can, first thing is, if you can access your data sequentially, it will have, a, you will see a performance increase. That's one thing. And the second thing is, if you can make your data use the same cache line, it will also, you will also have performance improvements in that case. So when is this important? A small example, for example, imagine you have a class and it has a string name and a float, an average mark, class student, which has a string name and a float, which is an average mark. And imagine you have 1 million students and you want to some calculate the average of average mark of all of them. And you go through the, you, you make a for loop and go through the array. And what happens then is that, what happens then is that you're accessing average mark is not the average marks of each of each students are not sequential memory. You're lo in each cache line, you're loading, loading the average mark, but you're also loading the name, which you don't use. In that case, if you create a, a, a one array for the names and the other name for the, for, the, uh, for the average mark, the processing of the average would be, would be much faster. So not much faster, it's like 3.4 3 times faster. So this is something to bear in mind for the high performance, high performance stuff. Okay. Questions? Uh, yeah, there's a question in the uh, YouTube chat. Um, can you recommend some books about the subject of uh, memory allocation and caches? Uh, I have a lot of things written on my blog on the Johnny Software Lab. So this is the, the so mm, this is the site here. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not aware of any books, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, so there are a few books on performance. I think one is uh, Urlich, Urlich Dipper. I think it's last name. Uh, everything a programmer needs to know about memory, and it's a really good, it's a really good read. Maybe that one is good. Okay, moving okay, on. Thank you. We have um, other questions in the chat here as well. Um, okay. Like, what about iterating via a pointer rather than an index? Does it make a measurable difference? Uh, I'll get to that a bit later. I have an example of that. Okay. Okay. Do you also cover alignment? What do you mean? Do I have alignment? A memory alignment. Mm, yeah, I need more context. I don't understand the question. Uh, it was more more of a comment actually. Uh, that's about the importance of uh, having uh data aligned uh, as per its type that okay. comes into play when you when you have packed uh, structs and you may for example have an integer on a uh, on an address that doesn't divide by its size so the alignment so okay alignment is a complicated issue so this in my example i use ints so which are four bytes inside so i didn't have any alignment problems uh, alignment, alignment, 
there are some some hardware architectures that they have of explicit alignment requirements. If alignment requirements are not met, then your program will crash. X86 is not one of them. For example, MIPS is one of them. Most embedded things. What else about the alignment? How, what, what was the question? The, the, there are, actually, there are things worse than crashing. On older versions of ARM, uh, if you are trying to read from an aligned address, you wouldn't crash, you would, you would just get garbage. And good luck debugging that. On, uh, uh -oh. on, on Windows, it's a uh, much better uh, behavior. You just get a performance hit because you have uh, two, uh, two uh, reads or writes instead of one. But other than that, it works. Yes, yes. But in my case, OK, that's true. And the alignment does influence performance of your code. So but I, we can talk about it later. I don't have it in the slides. And I want to finish. I have a lot of things to say. OK. Hello? Yeah, sure. OK, thank you. But that's true. Alignment is important. Alignment, if not properly done, uh, can influence the performance of your program, but you won't normally you won't hit alignment issues because the compiler will normally align data for you unless you do some funky stuff. You should not hit any alignment problems in your programs unless you do networking and especially serializing stuff. Yeah, that, that, that's the funky stuff. Okay, in your in your CPU has several types of cache memories. One is called the data cache memory. And data needed by the instructions is kept in the data cache memory. And this is the most important cache memory, which when you are not using it correctly, it can cause your program to slow down. And most of the performance work is done there. So you're going to do it there, optimizing data access patterns in order to better use the data cache memory. Other types of memory is called instruction cache memory, where the instructions themselves are kept in instructions cache memory, instruction cache memory. Uh, and normally you don't do any optimization there. The compiler know, knows these things best. Sometimes you might tweak this, but rarely. At least I didn't, I, I never did it. There is the third type of memory, uh, cache memory called TLB, translation look aside buffer cache memory. It, it is used for, for translating virtual addresses to physical addresses. So normally it's not the bottleneck, but if you have a data structure, which is really large and it's accessed randomly, so you're just jumping around memory, chasing pointers or calculate, calculating entrance using hashes. In that case, you might see performance degradation due to TLB caches, TLB cache, cache misses. Operating, so uh, each, Memory page on Linux is typically, again, typically four kilobytes inside, but Linux offers large or huge virtual pages that are two megabytes in size and then help you mitigate TLB cache misses. This can be done. For example, my SQL, the database, you can turn on huge, huge, um, huge uh, uh, virtual pages in order to speed them up. But you need to configure your application. You need, need to configure your operating system in order to use them. I'll show an example, but we won't talk about it. OK, this was about mem memory types. Next is the cache memory levels. So until now, I talked about there is data cache. But actually, on the CPU, there are levels of data cache. There is level 1 cache, level 2 cache. In modern system, you often have a level 3 cache. And smaller levels are, are, are closer to the CPU, but faster. If, um, if a memory is already in register, so if a, if a piece of data is in register, it takes one cycle to access it. If it's in one L1 cache, it takes three to five cycles to access it. If it's in L2 cache, it will take 20, 12 to 20 cycles. And if it's main memory, it take 100 to 300 cycles. So this depends a lot of on the architecture and, and the CPU speed. But normally, the faster the CPU, the more cycles it will take to access the, the caches and the main memory. OK, why is this thing important is later you will see when we measure cache memory, data cache misses and data cache, uh, data cache misses and data cache uh, hit, data cache miss rate, you will see that 
it is in, you can measure LL1 cash miss rate, L2 mesh miss rate, LLC. LLC is last level cash miss rate. In this case, it's L2. You can measure those, but just the number you doesn't give you exactly, doesn't tell you exactly what's the problem. So you need to be a bit careful here, okay? Okay, is this talk about memory levels here clear? I think these simple things. Okay. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. Cool. So from the harder perspective, arrays or vectors with sequential access are the best way to process data. If you're processing data, you want to do, do, do it on arrays or on vectors. If you're doing a lookup on data, you're going to find something and you have like an array which is five megabytes in size, normally you, you won't do it sequentially because it wastes time. I mean, the cache performance will be great, but the, the general performance will be low because you're doing a lot of unnecessary instructions. When does a data cache miss happens? So anytime you're accessing a memory location that you haven't accessed before, if you are dereferencing a pointer or using a, it will often create memory cache, data cache miss. And as a result, that CPU stalls. So CPU is waiting for the memory. So if you have a linked list and you're following a linked list, every time you access a new element of the linked list, possibly you might possibly have a data cache miss. This is not the case for the arrays. And you should not use linked lists because they're really, really bad in, for, for cache memory performance. There are some sometimes that you want to use linked lists, but normally you don't want to do them. Trees are again examples of where you can suffer from 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 uh, uh, data mem data cache miss. So because every time you do reference a pointer to move to another node in the tree, you will see a cache miss. Hash maps again. You're accessing an array. So you have a block of memory which is actually an array, and you're accessing a single element, but it's a random, and the prefetcher cannot do anything about here about it. Okay, next, the talk about polymorphism in C++. In C++, polymorphism is achieved by use, using pointers. Okay, again, see this std vector base class with star. From the point of view of performance, this can, it, it, it doesn't need to be, but it can be really, really inefficient. If you have a, uh, a huge data set, like a data structure which is more than megabytes in size, like we have one mega uh, mega objects. Uh, you might the referencing pointers can slow down your program significantly, and you'll see to what extent. Uh, why does that happen? Because pointers, although the pointers themselves are consecutive in memory, they're, you're accessing them one by one. The things they point to don't need to be consecutive in memory. If your data structure is small and fits nicely into the data cache, you, you might not see any performance gain, or you can even see performance regression if you try to, to, to play with this. So here's, here's an example. You see, this is the base class, a vector of base class pointers, and each point, and this is the memory that it's pointing to. And you see that the pointer, uh, consecutive pointers point to consecutive uh, consecutive uh, consecutive um, uh, memory locations, and this is like optimal layout. If you are, if you're, if you're, if you, if the memory layout looks like this, you will get really decent performance. It won't be any worse than just accessing array of values. But when you create with new and delete objects with delete, there is no guarantee ab about the memory layout. So it might happen, it's slower. It, it, it can be really, really slow. So you need to take care of this if performance is, is important. So here is an example of non-optimal layout where the first element points to the last block of memory, the second points to the second and so on. This is a non-optimal lay layout. And your case will be somewhere in between. So malloc will typically return consecutive memories. But if it has some free blocks, it will reuse them. And there is no guarantee about the memory layout if you're just calling malloc and free without taking care of how they work internally. So uh, array of values versus array of pointers. So polymorphism in C++ is achieved using array of pointers. 
And this stuff is taken from an article from the Johnny Sutter lab, Process Polymorphic Arrays in Lightning Speed. Arrays of values are much better for performance compared to arrays of, array of pointers. Why? First, all memory is allocated in a single block. So, second, there are no calls to malloc and free. So, there is no memory fragmentation. Uh, if you're sequentially accessing uh, the objects in the array, that means that you're accessing sequentially accessing memory addresses. There is no virtual dispatching mechanism to slow things down. That's something unrelated to data cache, but it also has performance implications. Additionally, if you're using an array of values, you can enable small function in lies, inlining because type is known at compile time. Downside, if you're using arrays of values, is, is there no, no polymorphism? In case of speed, you will prefer arrays of values. And it is also, also possible to implement arrays of values with polymorphism. Check out this article called, uh, just a second. Check out this article, Process Polymorphic Arrays in Lightning Speeds. Speed, and you will see the implementation of arrays of values with polymorphism. Now, an example in the command line. Let's do the example. Uh, no. Mm. So this is from an article I wrote some time ago. Let me show you the source code here. What does it do? Except that I have a better idea. Visual Studio. So, so this is Visual Studio and I have uh, I have my objects here. So I have a base class, base class called object, okay? And it has this virtual method called draw, which draws the objects on a given bitmap. And then from this object, I inherit a circle. Then I inherit a rectangle. And finally, I inherit a line. And finally, I inherit. Um, I'm sorry. Can you uh, make the font a little bit bigger, please? Yes. Should I? Um, where is this thing? Appearance. Full screen. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you see it now? It looks good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So there is this class called object with method draw. And then I inherit, I create a class circle where I implement this method draw. Then I inherit a class called rectangle. Again, I implement this method draw. And then I inherit a class line. Again, implement the method draw. And there is this class monster, which inherits double from line and from circle. Again, it has a draw. It doesn't do anything. Okay. Now my question was, my question was, we wanted to compare array of pointers with array of values, okay? So let me show you. I have array of pointers. I have array of pointers. Let me try to find it. Okay. So I create a vector of pointers to the object star. And then I create circles, lines, rectangle, and monster. And then I call draw for each element of the array. That's one thing I do. That's the pointers. And you want to compare them with array of values. So in this case, I have four vectors. One is for circle, one is for line, one is for rectangle, and one is for monster. I fill each of those, feature each of those vectors, and then I first call draw on on for the for the line for circle for rectangle and for monster okay and let's measure the performance difference so what do you get what do you guys guess what will be faster and to what extent
Any guesses? Okay, let's do it like this. So this will run on pointers. So drawing pointers took 3.7 milliseconds. And let's do it on array of values. Array value is just a bit, uh, it's a bit slower, 3.6 versus 3.7. And you might say, ha, it doesn't matter. We can use array of pointers. And that's true. But uh, it, this is an example program here. And it called, uh, uh, let me try to find it. Uh, it called uh, new on a memory block that's pretty empty. There weren't, there wasn't any fragmentation, and the memory layout of the objects pointed to do is close to optimal, if not optimal. But what happens if we, if we uh, shuffle the pointers in the array? Can you guess what would happen then? So I have this option S for shuffle, and let's shuffle the pointers. But that's the worst case, completely non-optimal memory layout. So if the memory lay layout is perfect, you will get 3.7 seconds. If the memory layout is not perfect, is completely irregular, you'll get 14.8 seconds. So it's five times the difference in speed. And depending, if you, especially if your program is long running one and if you're allocating the allocating blocks and it's reusing old blocks, it might happen the memory layout is not good. And in that case, you might get performance performance um, degradation, okay? There, for example, in the gaming in industry, they really avoid this array, array of pointers it's exactly for this reason. You don't know its performance. Okay, moving on. Any questions? Not at the moment from my side. Cool. Okay, next example is a binary tree example. So let me give you a small introduction for those who don't know what binary tree is. It's a data structure used for fast lookup. We use it to check if the value is present in the binary tree, insert the value or remove it. So here's an example of binary tree. So we want to check if the element number five is in the tree. So we go to the root. Is five smaller? or larger than eight. If it's smaller, we go left. If it's larger, we go right. So it's smaller, we go left. Is five smaller or, la or larger than three? It's larger, we go right. Is five smaller or, or larger than six? Well, it's smaller, we go left. Is four small, five smaller or larger than four? It's, it's larger, it should be here. It's not there, that means that five is not present in, in, in this binary tree. So the idea is really simple. So each node in the binary tree, so node is eight with these two pointers, three is a node with these two pointers, six is a node with these two pointers. Each node in the binary tree is represented with a struct node, and here it has. It, it holds the value, it holds the left pointer, and it holds the right pointer, okay? So memory is one dimensional, whereas the binary layout, structure, binary lay layout of this structure is two dimensional. Now question is how to optimally represent this memory structure in memory for optimal access. So again, here is a, here is a tree, eight, five, 11, three, seven, uh, pointer, three, seven, nine, 13. So I created, I wrote an implementation of a binary tree and I created it, I created, uh, I created three memory layouts for this. So first we call it breadth first search layout. We put first nodes on the first level. So this is the first level, then the second level, then the third level. And we have eight, five, 11. So eight, five, 11. And the third level is three, seven, nine, 13. That's the breadth first implementation, breadth, breadth. Second is the depth first, de depth first search layout, the DFS order. 
In this case, we visit the current node, we visit eight. If it has left subtree, we go and visit it. So we visit five. If it has, uh, if five has a left sub subtree, it has, we go and visit it. So we allocate eight, then we allocate five, then we allocate three. Then we go back, we allocate seven. Then we go back, go back. We allocate 11, we allocate nine, go back and we allocate 13. So this is the DFS order. And the third one is a random order. We called malloc in some order and it gave us some memory. We don't know how, how it's used. We don't know the memory layout of that data structure. So what would you guess is the most optimal layout to check if, what is the most optimal layout to check if, uh, if a value is present in this binary tree? Does anybody have any guess? DFS. DFS. Why? Because it, you mostly advance contiguously. I please explain. I mean, you start searching. Let's say you're looking for, um, or uh, I don't know, or seven. I'm gonna go eight five seven. So you go in ascending order. The axes are a bit pretty close to one another. Okay, so in case of in case of BFS breadfast search, eight and five are consecutive memory, but five and three are you will if you're accessing five, the next thing you will access three or seven. In the DFS order, okay, and this is very very this is really, really a shallow tree. But you want if you're accessing them together, you want them to be close in the memory. So the BFS order, if you're accessing eight with the 50% 50% possibility, you will, uh, probability will access five and eight and five are consecutive in memory. They might share the same cache line. So this access is free. And for example, you're kill 11 and you will access, you will access from 11, you will access nine or 13. Okay. And you see in the DFS order next to 11 is nine and the BFS next to 11 is three and 11 and three are completely unrelated. You see? So DFS in, is actually faster. Random order is as, as good as BFS order. Maybe a bit better, maybe BFS is a bit better, but doesn't matter. So let's do examples. So examples are more, are always more, more interesting, at least I find. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. binary tree. Uh. Let's see BFS. So this is breadth research, a slash a optimal means that I'm using my own allocator implementation that uh, that is allocated, it's giving memory, if you call allocate and then allocate, you'll get two allocates, one after another, and you'll get two consecutive chunks in memory. That's why it's optimal. And you see that with BFS, an optimal allocation, so I'm using a custom allocator, as I said, it takes 6.7 seconds. And in case of DFS, um, I'm sorry, could you explain why BFS layout is faster? Sorry? Could you explain why BFS layout is faster? It's really simple. So in this case, let me just move to full screen. So your access pattern is you're accessing eight with 50% probability, probability you will access five and eight and five are consecutive in memory. 11 is not, but since eight and five can share the same cache line, when if you already loaded your eight into memory, you will probably have your five already in the memory. Again, if you're accessing 11, then with 50% chance you will access number nine. And you see in the DFS or in the BF, uh, DFS order, 
11 and 9 are consecutive in memory. In BFS order, they're not. 11 and 9 are not consecutive in memory. Actually, 11 and 13, 11 and 9, they're not consecutive at all. So you're just, you're, you're getting more cache misses here. So you're accessing data, your data access pattern and your memory layout, if they correspond to one another, that will give you performance improvements, okay? Okay, is this clear? You can ask, I can explain it again. I can try to rephrase it if it's not clear. No, thank you, it's clear. Okay, so the question was yesterday, I figured out there is an even better way to do it. It's called Van M. de Boas layout. So what does that mean? When you are allocating root, you're also allocating two consecutive chunks. So you're allocating one, two, and three. So when you're accessing one, you get two and three for 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 uh, cheap. So you'll get them very cheap memory access. Again, on the next level, four, five, and six. If you're accessing them, if you're allocating four, five, and six, you'll get them for cheap. You'll get them cheap. So I figured out this yesterday. I read about it, and I implemented. So this thing is even better. No web one. So this guy was a data scientist and he figured this out. So you see, 4.1 seconds versus 4.7 seconds versus 6.7 seconds. Okay. So you see this significant performance improvement. Now, the question would be can we go faster? What do you guys say? Well, actually, we can. Let me show you. So this is a perf command that measures that measures uh, data cache misses and such stuff. I need to run this on my own computer because the AMD processor doesn't support this. Let me just zoom in my terminal. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so this code has 2.7% of data TLB cache misses, those TLB cache that's related to translation of virtual to physical memory. But if you use large pages, we can get better. So VB had uh, had uh, 4.1 second, but if I specify large pages, let's see how much does it have then. So we're using large pages here. It's 3.6, so it's even better. Now question is, can we do better? Actually, we can do better. <laughs> so all these programs that work with pointers, on 64-bit machines, uh, pointers are 64, eight bytes in size. On 32-bit machines, the pointers are, are uh, four bytes in size. For those programs that have a lot of cache misses and are, as our example here, if we can recompile our program with, uh, for 32-bit system, we might get some performance improvement. And let's try to do that, okay? Uh, so I'm adding flex to compile for thirty for, for a thirty two bit system. Let's uh, OK. 
Okay. Let's see now. So we went from 3.6 seconds to 3.3 seconds. So what happened? Does anybody have an explanation? Okay, the size of this struct is 24 bytes on the on the 64-bit system, but only 12 bytes on the 32-bit system, if this T is integer. And in that case, there is a larger chance that more than one node share the same cache line. And that that's where we get our speed improvements from. Okay. So let's make a summary. We gain performance if we allocate a dedicated block of memory for the data structures. So in my case, I used a dedicated block of memory for I asked I I parameterize my binary tree with the with the custom memory allocator that returns consecutive blocks of memory. So for me, speed was important. It, the memory consumption was not that important. What does this make is that related data is kept in one place, so we have a better data cache, cache hit rate. We can achieve only this with a custom allocated. The additional benefit is the added benefit is we are using a custom custom allocator and allocating from a single block. When the data structure is destroyed, we can release the whole blo block back to the operating system. What we also do is we try to keep the block of memory as compact as possible, because this also increases data cache, cache hit rate. So if, if I were allocating my binary tree using a, a general purpose allocator, I would get worse performance than when they're using a custom allocator, allocator and I'm allocating from a block. In my example, in my implementation of binary tree, I, um, in my implementation of binary tree, I had, um, I had, um, it, it should not be compared with the STL implementation of uh, STD set. It's, it's simply not fair because my implementation doesn't do any insertion, doesn't do any removal, removal of the elements of the of the of the nodes in the tree, so I can have a perfect, perfectly balanced tree, perfectly perfect the best possible memory layout, and this of course increases performance. Uh, if we take advantage of cache line, uh, we gain performance if we take advantage of cache line organization. If two nodes are adjacent in the tree and they're adjacent in memory, there is a high probability they will share the same cache line. If they share the same cache line, we get the access with no caches misses. Next, we take advantage, we gain performance if we take advantage of the prefetcher. So from time to time, the other prefetcher can get activated if we are accessing, if it figures out a pattern. And in that case, we can get some performance from that. The next thing, thing we keep the struct node as compact as possible. That example, when I, when I recompiled my program with for 32-bit, 32-bit uh, code, 32-bit uh, machine, uh, I gained some performance. Uh, that was exactly because the struct node went from 24 bytes in size to 12 bytes in size. So on 64-bit systems, only 48 bits of pointers are actually used. So if you have two pointers you can decrease the size of struct node. Of course, you can compile your program for the 32-bit system. Okay, this is two more slides and we're done. I'm sorry that uh, it took us a bit more time, but I want you to see all the examples. I hope you're not tired. So binary tree modification. If we have a perfectly binary tree with perfect order and now we are adding and removing nodes, that slowly makes the memory layout less and less optimal. And after some time, the accesses become slower and slower. This is also some kind of fragmentation, but a different kind. So what are the solutions there? You can recreate the data structure, which is optimal again, or perform some kind of def defragmentation of the existing data structure where we rearrange nodes so they correspond better to the memory layout. One of the things we can do is not to delete them. In case of, in case of our binary tree, we, we can decide not to delete the nodes. We can keep them around for some time if they can be reused, to be reused if opportunity arises. Uh, 
everything we do here, so recreating defragmentation de takes some time, and you should consider to think if this is really needed. But if your program is uh, has three cycles, time where it can do this kind of defragmentation, maybe it's worth it. Okay, so that's it. Any questions? Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, let's just make a conclusion and we're done. Uh, so on modern day system, memory bottleneck is the thing that often limits you the speed of your program. If you carefully design, you can mitigate some of those problems. If in performance is important, you need to prefer vectors of values when possible. Object oriented design is not performance friendly. There is a possibility of many cache misses due to scattered data. There is a branch prediction misses due to polymorphism. In some industries where performance is important and notably gaming industry, they use a different approach called data-oriented design. So if you're interested about performance, you should read about it. Electronic Arts, the game developer company, has its own implementation of standard library, which focuses on performance. Uh, you can look, Google it up. There are many great ideas on how to do optimization for performance sensitive applications. Okay, that's it guys. I would like to thank you very much, but I have a, uh, I have a, I have a favor to ask. So help me make this talk better. Visit this link. It's a short survey, four questions. Just answer them so I know what, if I were talking too fast, slow, too slow some of the things were not explained well and so on. So it will take like one minute. So please do that.